Today on X-Play, could the Fantastic Four game possibly be worse than the movie? Are you talking to me? Is Harvest Moon, Another Wonderful Life, more addictive than crap? And will Shadow of the Colossus make you wet yourself with joy? I sure did. It's game time. <laughs> to avoid the last house on the left. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Yes, we do. Also, the hills have eyes. Pass it on. Hello and welcome to this superhuman edition of X-Play. On today's show, we get bombarded by cosmic rays and wind up reviewing the Fantastic Four game. Plus, we enter the terrifying world of dice. And if you think it has something to do with Dungeons and Dragons or a misogynist stand-up comedian, you are wrong. Plus, the one farming sim to rule them all and in the darkness milk them. Oh it's a review of the new Harvest Moon game. Let's never mix Lord of the Rings and milking ever again. I now have thoughts of, of Nazgul's with sore nipples. Oh, God. You took it to the bad place, Sessler. You and you alone. Well, plus, because someone has to do it, we review Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And you know it's not going to be good. You just know. And last but not least, the game that took our breath away at the Tokyo Game Show is here. And today we get our hands all over a shadow of the Colossus. As long as you don't try to milk it. It was a poor choice of words, yeah. okay? I admit it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Here's a Fantastic Four review to make it better. Okay. Before Spider-Man, before the Hulk, before George Clooney, there was the Fantastic Four. Following in the footsteps of every comic book character this side of Marmaduke, the Fantastic Four have made an average movie, which only leads to, yes, the average video game. The Fantastic Four, we know them well. The brain, the beauty, the flamer, and the commish. Bombarded by cosmic rays, yada, 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 they become the Fantastic Four and fight the good fight. A team. Well, considering this game, it's more like fighting the middling fight. We wanted to get Stan Lee to make some comments for this segment, but he never returned our calls. Nor did we make any. But we have the fifth best thing. It's Roger the Stan Lee Experience. He's not Stan Lee, but an incredibly inaccurate simulation. Kids, please cover your ears. So I called Jack Kirby into my office, and I got to cover a Fantastic 473 sitting there, and I said, hey, Jack, you notice anything different about it? And he said, yeah, my name's not on it. And I said, that's because you're fired. Get the f out of my office. It was the best Ben Grimm he ever drew. I'd say the voice acting left a lot to be desired, but what's the point? It's a movie game. So much for diplomacy. It doesn't follow the movie plot specifically, that's one good thing, so you can fight other villains from the Fantastic Four's history. But simply put, the game is a button masher. <laughs> I work really Don't we expect more from our heroes? Koibi walks into my office and he pitches me the idea for the Fantastic Four. And I says to him, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. Get the f out of my office. Not five seconds later, I copyright the idea and the money rolls in like gangbusters. Kirby never got a cent. What a dumbass. Look at Mr. F stretch his way to victory. I haven't seen a stretch like that since Robert Blake's alibi. Kids always ask me, where did the idea for Mr. Fantastic come from? Two words. My pants. Don't believe me? Ask Koibi's wife. Dead. Fantastic Four is unoriginal in every way. I've seen better innovation in a Rob Liefeld retrospective than I've seen here. The game is not what it could be. Hmm, a disappointing movie-based game? I'm shocked. Yet, if you're a Fantastic Four fan, you may like it. I don't know, I'm trying to find something good here. Galactus was my idea. I told Koibi, He's a big guy in a purple suit that eats planets to sustain life. Kind of like how I f***ed your wife last night. The analogy didn't make sense, but Koibi, he got the message. Fantastic Four gets three, it's not clobbering times, out of five. Excelsior! Nuff said. Nuff said. 
Wow. So Stanley will be suing us now, or maybe just a couple minutes from now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, enough said. You know, Marvel was doing such a good job with the comic book movies. Spidey 1 and 2, and X-Men 1 and 2, and even Blade 2. And then they made Fantastic Four, and The Hulk, and Elektra into really bad movies. And then they gave the third X-Men movie to the guy who directed After the Sunset. Cry bitter gamma radiated tears of rage, fanboys. The party is officially over. Well, that's the closest you'll get to a soliloquy on this show. Now, here's a game for 10-year-olds called Dice that's about robot dinosaurs. Alas, poor Dice. I previewed it well. Ever since mankind first battled dinosaurs in the Bible, children have been obsessed with turning them into cars. Well, finally, there's a TV show and video game to satisfy our automotive pagan needs. Oh. Dice. It's kind of like that Robert Rodriguez movie. You know, the one he let his eight-year-old son write. It makes us all the things children find fantastic, like dinosaurs and transforming dinosaur robots. Libertize! Add in bright colors, a bad theme song. A splash of moral righteousness. There's really no need for such weapons, is there? And you have a surprisingly fun preview. <laughs> D-I-C-E is an acronym for DNA Integrated Cybernetic Enterprises. Yep, I don't understand what it means either. But isn't there some kind of rule against using an acronym inside an acronym? Because technically DICE really stands for Deoxyrobonucleic Acid Integrated Cybernetic Enterprises, which makes even less sense. The truth is, no one knows why a company would assign a group of children to pilot robot dinosaurs to protect a galaxy from various bad things. I suppose, like most children's programming, none of this matters because the point of the game is to ride around in giant dinosaur robots that turn into motorcycles. The majority of the preview had us in Dino Breaker mode, where you'll stomp around destroying enemies as a dinosaur. These stages are simple, straightforward action. Enter a room, destroy bad guys, find end boss, and power up. Sure, this one, right? But certain aspects of the game will also make you jump out and fight on foot. Holy did you see that? Why is he crawling on the ground? And how does he do it so fast? Finally, for quick travel and racing games, you'll have to transform into a vehicle. It's like F-Zero, only slow. And since the game will be marketed for younglings, the controls are basic. This makes for a fast-paced game that's easy to jump right into. The story, however, will leave most adults feeling confused and scared. Losing such a powerful weapon to pirates would seriously damage Humpty Electronics' reputation. I mean, I like the idea of space pirates, but eight-year-olds shouldn't be worried about the reputations of imaginary corporations. However, the game does try and teach children about the beauty of nature and the dangers of poaching. These poachers are pushing this planet's native species toward extinction. Poachers aren't concerned about these things, though. They're nothing more than dangerous criminals who don't care who or what they hurt. So what do the children do right after talking about the frailty of nature's ecosystems? They take their giant robot dinosaurs to the endangered planet and start killing any animal they see. Oh, look, a rare mosquito. Die! Okay, so I need to forget that the story makes Full Metal Alchemist look like Dostoevsky. Because the gameplay is simple, solid fun with some minor tweaking, this should be an exciting kids game. You can expect to see Dice sometime this fall. What surprises me is his complete lack of remorse. That is some quality voice acting. Hey, if you like Virtual Quest, I'm sure you'll like this one. Did anyone actually like Virtual Quest? There was an eight-year-old in Peoria. He was fond of it. Oh. Up next, Harvest Moon will own you. Yeah, I know it's a farming sim, but prepare for ownage. Going, going, gone. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to X-Play, the show that isn't afraid to dazzle the red states with a farming sim. Yes, if you've ever yearned to till a fertile field or milk a cow virtually, then the Harvest Moon series is for you. Sure, the series is most notable for having a spin-off game with one of the worst titles of all time. Harvest Moon, Friends of Mineral Town. But we love it because it's totally addictive. Well, let's be honest, we all want to be friends of Mineral Town. I guess so. So here's our review of the latest installment in the Harvest Moon series. Harvest Moon, another wonderful life. Yay! Ah, the smell of that fresh morning air, a sound of the distant rooster, the way the light swims across the field at dark damn 30. 
This is the life you city slickers could never know about, the life of the farmer. I know, I know such changes are a mere pipe dream. There's no way to win such an urban lottery. Well, think again, my friends, because the GameCube has bestowed upon us a sequel to the agricultural RPG, Harvest Moon, Another Wonderful Life. Now, while most of the game remains pretty much identical to the 2004 original, there is one major difference, the main character's gender. This time, they've put the women to work. Sick of the hustle and bustle of city life, you decide to give manual labor a shot on your deceased father's farm in Forget-Me-Not Valley. Also residing on your newly inherited property is a large cast of characters ranging from struggling artists, hippies, Elvis impersonators, and a lot of creepy old people. Uh, what's the point of wearing a hairnet when you have no hair? Must be a new fashion trend. But the leader of the pack is family friend Takakura, who looks like he spent most of the farm's fertilizer on his eyebrows. Eugene Levy, looks like you've been usurped. While you are taking care of business, there are many things to keep you occupied. Growing and selling crops, making sure your animals are happy, ridding the field of unwanted animals, and trying to keep out the riffraff. Ew, take a shower and don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. But life on the farm isn't all work. Daddy's little girl still gets to ride on her little pony and gaze at herself in the mirror. <laughs> I still got it. I'm still young. Yeah, rub it in, why don't you? But if you want to really relax, you get to sample the Earth's special vegetables and trip on mushrooms. Oh yeah, when the parents are away, the girl will play. Speaking of play, in order to advance through the game, you gotta get yourself hitched to one of the three eligible bachelors. No, not Snap, Crackle, and Pop. Take it away, Chuck. Thanks, Morgan. Let's meet our bachelors. First, we have Rock. He may not have much in his pocket, but he knows how to treat a lady. Then there's Marlin. Drinking is his favorite hobby and has an impressive lounge act. And finally, we have Gustafa. He enjoys barefoot walks everywhere and smoking the lazy leaf. So which one will our bachelorette choose? Back to you, Morgan. Now, the game is more of a reimagining than a straight-up sequel. It still has the same simple yet vibrant graphics, same easy-to-use controls. Hell, it even has the same cast of characters. But it does offer a couple new features, like improved game pacing and a chicken pen to keep count of your feathered friends. Okay, line up for a head count. One. Damn, I need to get more chickens. If you're a fan of the original Harvest Moon, don't expect anything drastically new except two X chromosomes. But for those of you who would like a pleasing compliment to your copy of Animal Crossing, this game will keep you occupied for months and months and months. Still, it's a game about farming. Yeah, after a long, rough day of working with prima donna Sessler, the first thing I want to do is go bust my ass milking cows. Mm, cute, loving cows. We give Harvest Moon another wonderful life, a three out of five. Did you just call me a prima donna in that review? I like cows, they're so cute. Are you avoiding my question by talking about cows being cute? Yes, cute little cows. They're but me. Cute. Up next, movie games always suck, but this one has Johnny Depp. At least I think that's Johnny Depp. Planted with tiny G4 tracking devices, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. And they explode if we leave the set. Call for help. Welcome back to X-Play. Into every summer, a bad blockbuster movie must fall. This summer, there were oh so many. Stealth, The Island, Triple X, State of the Union. But none of those movies had games made out of them. Yet. So, we had to sell up for reviewing the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory game. We hope you enjoy it more than we did. Hey, Willy Wonka, have you a game? Or like other spin-offs, are you just lame? you come a long way, Charlie Bucket. Such a long way, in fact, that you're barely recognizable. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory for the Xbox has taken so many liberties with Roald Dahl's original story that it may seem hard to recognize. You may also have trouble recognizing it as anything resembling a video game. The story now makes Charlie the writer of all wrongs committed by the other children. It's up to Charlie to juice Violet, for example. Wonkabots, Charlie's peculiar adversaries in the game, are created by Mike TV. The Wonkabots were being created to replace the already enslaved Oompa Loompas. This title trots along with tenacious tedium, draining color from the faces of even the youngest of players. Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. 
The game begins in relatively familiar territory, with Charlie and Gramps trying to gain access to Mr. Wonka's air-polluting factory of wonder. Young Charles's initial challenge is to grab the catch necessary to obtain the ticket. This, of course, becomes a whimsical analogy of self-determined capitalism. Charlie's desperate clutching to escape the grim poverty of his grandfather starts with his green cash sprout and ends on top of Mr. Wonka's chocolate chair, master of all that's sweet. The problem is, as you progress through the game, you'll begin to realize the tedium supplied by the title's fatally flawed control system. Buttons at times needed to be depressed repeatedly to make certain things happen. The controller to character response ratio was noticeably inaccurate, making platforming a pain in the keister and objective repetition far too common. The game is insulting, aiming at the perceived lower expectations of kid gamers. We at SA believe that kids don't deserve crappy games. Very few kids will finish this title based on the inaccurate controls and flat sameness of much of the environment. Many of the rooms and objectives seem to repeat. Just when you think you've completed an objective, like freeing Augustus Gloop, yes, he's out of the pipe. You have to repeat the objective in a similar environment. No, he's back in the river. Great. Charlie's combat system is candy-based and sides more on the sweet rather than the mighty. <laughs> There's very little satisfaction when vanquishing villains, and there's very little taste to this title. I mean, it rubs our rhubarb to try and foist this crap on a kid, or adult that may have enjoyed the book or movies the title is based on. Don't get suckered. Don't buy it or rent it. Read it and love it. With stale chocolate breath, we breathe a one out of five. Can you, can you still hear that? Yeah. That's the sound of the game, still sucking. If you're a parent, don't damage your kid by making them play this. Try Katamari Damashi, try Mario Kart. But don't ever buy Junior some crappy movie game tie-in. It's cruel and unusual. Kind of like forcing us to take a commercial break. Yeah, pretty much like that. Up next, Shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> wow, that dude is big. <laughs> Will Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb please report to the white courtesy phone? Now? <laughs> Welcome back to X-Play, the show that sits through the blood of so-so games to pluck gems from the muck. In other words, after all the crap we've reviewed on today's show, we finally have something awesome. When we first saw this at the Tokyo Game Show, we were blown away by its moody atmosphere and gorgeous graphics. And now, at long last, we actually get to play it. Here's our preview of Shadow of the Colossus. Something big is coming this way. Something gigantic, immense. Huge, enormous, gargantuan, and yes, you could even say, colossal. From the fine people who brought you the beautiful yet overlooked game Eco, comes a game that refuses to stay in the darkness. Shadow of the Colossus brings together the traditional feel of an adventure game, vast landscapes, a haunting soundtrack, and more of what gamers really want in an epic title. Oh, that's not what I'm talking about. Bosses, people. Big bosses. You're not a prince or some long forgotten warrior. Hell, you're hardly even athletic. Just look at the way you swim and run. Link, you are not. You are, however, her only hope. Who is this barely moving girl exactly? A loved one, a girlfriend, a sister? Who knows? That's between you and the booming Japanese voice in the sky. The deal boils down to you having to hunt down and destroy 16 colossuses. Um, colossuses? Colossi? Big things for the sake of a girl. A fully clothed girl, you pervs. With a whistle and a jump, you'll be racing through the immense landscape. By reflecting the light off the sword, you can find where these wild things roam. Don't worry, they're easy to spot. Your first task will be to find a way onto the beast. Each colossus has a way of moving around, stomping or slinging a blunt object. Instead of the traditional dungeon to drudge through, you'll be working hand over fist through matted hair. Oh, colossal cheek squeak. 
Keep an eye on the grip meter. It's the little circle thing in the corner. When that runs out, fingers slip and gravity reminds you of how the ground feels up close. The game's minimalist interpretation of the epic genre is intriguing. No towns, no hordes of enemies, no upgrades to speak of. It's you, a sword, a bow, your friend Flicka, and a vast landscape teeming with Colossus says, giant monstrosities. Lighting, particle effects, and motion blur add a sense of drama by making every battle larger than life. From what we've seen, the game looks incredible, presents tight controls, and lets you ride through majestic environments to battle against insurmountable forces. Yeah. We still have a few unanswered questions, such as, what's with the dark worms? What are these ghost things? And how long can a game with only bosses last? Hopefully, we'll uncover the answer to these questions and more when we take on the Shadow of the Colossus this fall. Just watch out for falling colossi. Colossi? I don't know, but it looks amazing. I hope we guys hope that the gameplay can live up to the graphics because for a PS2 title, this is incredible. You know what would be more incredible? No, but you'll probably tell me. Getting through a show without reading viewer mail? Oh, yeah. But this isn't going to be that show. I thought so. Yeah. Today's viewer mail is from Nick B. Hi, Nick. I love X-Play, and I've watched it since it was extended play, and I've never seen you give a game less than two out of five. Are you even allowed to? We gave a game a one out of five today, my friend. And we gave it yesterday. And yeah. Of course, everyone always asks us if we've given a game a zero. And so far, we really haven't. You know, for it to earn a zero, it would, it would have to not be a game. Right. Like Pokemon Channel, but that, that still just got a that one. That got a one, and it really should have gotten a zero because it wasn't a game, really. You yeah. watched television, and your Pokemon didn't even want to play with you that much. It just wanted to watch TV. It was so bizarre. Yeah, that really hurt my feelings, and too. Then, and then if you let it with the remote control by itself or the TV, it would buy stuff with your bank account. Uh-huh. Like, like a like child. Pokemon credit card fraud. 